Okay. Can I ask you a very topical question, but because it's really important to the UK and people would lose respect for me if I didn't ask it. What's your view on UK content and how strict the government is being on actually implementing it? Sure. Well, there's two parts. I mean, I'm working in Scotland at the moment, which has you have to be able to bid into a project. You have to prove what you're going to do in Scotland. And then the UK government is now consulting on a beefed up version of what they call supply chain plans. Um, I have mixed views. Um, so UK content is important and we need to do more about it. Um, but the offshore wind industry essentially can't solve it by itself in isolation because some things are about how the wider economy works. So the UK on the whole has been an economy which has not prioritized investment in manufacturing. You know, it's a, it's a, we've, we've, we've built up a service economy, we, we have success in investment. You know, we have a healthy economy, but it's different to others in the German economy, Dan Danish economy. So, so we start from different points and you can't recreate therefore UK manufacturing excellence in offshore wind from scratch, particularly as um, you know, some of those countries, companies have got a head start. Mm. Having said that, you, the market is big enough you can do things to encourage those companies to invest here. So the good work with, which was done to bring Siemens, now Siemens Gamesa into Hull, that wouldn't have happened without government saying, you know, try and make this happen. Um, but equally, I would also like to see government do more in encouraging innovation and investment. Mm -hmm. And I think one of the things I see from consultancy and companies I work with is still a frustration that government can do early stage research well. There's lots of research programs, but the, 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 you know, what we all call the, the value of death, the point just before you get into being commercial and you can look after yourself and you'll succeed if you've got a good product. That point, that's where the UK does funding really badly. Mm -hmm. And um, so I see companies fail or struggling to get through that or going crawling forwards when they should be able to take big steps at that point and get to market quickly. Mm -hmm. And I think if we could fix that, we that's... have much, many more innovators coming into the market, really sort of, you know, being able to say, I've got a great idea for offshore wind. Yeah. And, and being able to prove themselves and win work. Because I think one of the things that really irks people in northeast of England, Humberside, and also in Scotland as well is through fabrication. And this is true in a lot of different sectors because it's how... It... So if one of the companies I'm a director for makes subsea equipment and they sell all around the world, and we can do that, fabrication due to its logistics and size is not something that you can just fabricate stuff in Middlesbrough and easily and commercially send it to China or wherever. And it's almost, it's how we play the argument to really help support UK business. And actually one of the things that I used to see, and it was almost from my time at the LEP, public sector myself, was that there was there's something called state aid rules, which is part of the EU, which, you know, you're not allowed to subsidize or support companies over a certain level using government money. Otherwise it's seen as being anti-competitive. Arguably with Brexit, I don't know actually how much that still applies. It'll depend on the negotiation. But in theory, touch wood, the potential was still there for the UK that it didn't have to follow EU state aid rules as tightly as it had done. Because one of the things that I used to find 10 years ago was that the, the UK would follow it to the letter of the law, but other places in Europe, other EU countries, very famous big ones, would be more lenient with their own supply chain. And it was one of those things that it's, that's I think often some of the things that people forget when Yes, Brexit has a lot of negatives, but there's still some potential yeah. positives, which, you know, because offshore wind is a sector that will grow for another 100 years. Sure. But I worry about that. I mean, so you're right about state aid, but I don't, it's not that state aid stopped us doing stuff. It's our attitude to how we applied the rules stopped us doing things, as okay. you say. And so, for example, uh, major ports in Europe fabricating floating or floating offshore wind um, platforms. You know, they've been able to benefit in part because of the tax structures. And we don't offer that those sorts of benefits or fiscal underpinnings you know, or subsidies in the way that others do that are clearly state aid compliant because otherwise they'd be challenged and swept away. Um, so in the conversation about Brexit, you know, a lot of the 
in the tenor of it is we'll be able to do things differently and we'll be able to be more innovative or we'll be able to be more dynamic and my worry is that well, that'll be great but where was the evidence of trying to be dynamic and pushing against those rules it wasn't there so so the, the worry with Brexit would be we still have that old mindset but we no longer have if you like that that market so if we can be okay. dynamic brilliant because it will really help but if if we're not going to be then then we won't get there those benefits of it which could really support offshore wind companies and supply chain companies yeah. but some of those traditional industries as well